All right, in this uh, particular segment, we're going to um, focus in on uh, hypnosis, which often um, raises all sorts of interesting questions for, um, for students that, uh, you know, you see, you might see a, um, a uh, stage uh, hypnotherapist um, in, um, uh, whether that's on TV or whether that's in other situations. So a few things I just want to underline for you and highlight you know, when we're talking about hypnosis. Um, it has been used in a variety of contexts, sometimes therapeutically, and one of the, the key places um, the, one of the first places to really talk about is just um, the question really of can anyone really be hypnotized and really the answer is no. It, the, um, the, it, it depends on the level of suggestibility actually um, and there are some folks that seem to be far more suggestible than others uh, hypnosis is one of these modalities that uh, uh, I had a fair amount of contact with in working with multiple personality disorder. And for a while, it was, um, it was one of the key modalities of therapy, um, thinking that we could manage uh, the other personality parts by hypnosis. Uh, but what we began to find out is that uh, hypnosis actually only certain people seem to be most responsive to it. And ironically enough, um, the people that were MPD had a very high rate of suggestibility. So can anyone be um, hypnotized? No. Can it, can it enhance the recall of, um, uh, recall of past events? Um, and, and again, you know, how do we know that for one and for another, really, I think you have to ask or have a, a clear understanding of this word recall. Um, most of us uh, don't understand the fact that memory itself, when we're talking about memory, is uh, a reconstructive act is the way I like to talk about it. I get my O in there. Um, and so we reconstruct on the fly because there are places in our memory that have gaps. And so um, in working with hypnosis, uh, I think we have to be very, very careful uh, regarding how it's used in terms of recalling um, forgotten or repressed events. That's another one that oftentimes uh, happens. The other one is, can uh, hypnosis be used therapeutically? And um, it, the reality is, is that uh, it, it can. Uh, it's been used. Uh, <clears throat> it's been used effectively. I gotta get my my uh, letters formed correctly here. It's been used effectively in uh, smoking treatment. Um, it has also been used effectively in um, uh, eating uh, obesity, and and it it varies really. There seems to be a, a strong following of people that swear by it. Others um, not so much so. Now the question is, and that's what this diagram up here really is trying to talk about, is is uh, really the bigger question of of how does it work. And two different theories occur, and part of it is, remember what I said earlier about attention, that uh, when attention is divided, um, then there isn't much attention at all. And that's really how some of these theories uh, that try to explain how hypnosis works is, is built. Is first of all, uh, the divided consciousness theory, uh, this one up here, uh, really kind of is built on something that we refer to as dissociation, which we'll, we'll talk about um, later in the, um, uh, in the semester when we talk about dissociative disorders and psych disorders. But dissociation is certainly one. Um, essentially what happens is that the person's attention is drawn away um, and so they uh, act a role so convincingly that they dissociate 
from their present day identity. The second one, of course, is social influence. And this is the, the social influence one is the one that I think a lot of times you see in a lot of the stage shows. And what you see are people acting and they don't really know that they are, but they're, they're acting the part of a hypnotized um, uh, person. And so they're of, uh, hypnotized. And that, I think, because of the social context of the party or a uh, stage show, uh, they end up acting this part, and that's what this social influence um, uh, theory is saying, is that the social context is so powerful that we end up acting in ways that we wouldn't otherwise act. Um, later in the semester, we will talk about uh, the Milgram studies uh, regarding uh, handling authority. And it was a significant study, partly because people ended up doing things that they wouldn't otherwise do simply because an authority told them to do it. And that's, and that's one of the issues that falls in when we actually are talking about hip, being hypnotized and so forth. Do they still experience the pain? I would suggest to you they do. Uh, it, it really is a matter of their attention. Now again, let's, rec let's refresh a little bit. When we talk about attention, it, it's, it is a spotlight. And so when their attention is drawn away to paying attention to something else, then they would appear as if um, they're, they're uh, ignoring or acting as if the pain actually didn't occur. And that's part of the backdrop when we talk about hypnosis. Um, it has gotten highly dramatized because of a lot of the shows and so forth. Uh, I think in a lot of cases, um, the Amazing Randy, which I had the video that you could look at, um, would probably debunk a lot of these things, uh, partly because of um, the kind of the scientific question of uh, how is this happening? What's the source of data? Can we, can we do a control group? And as a matter of fact, in, in one case, they actually subjected the group to a control group, and they, they actually found that participants who were instructed to do a certain act, acted just as much li uh, like a hypnotized patient when in fact they weren't. So that's some, uh, some of the overview. Two key issues in terms of theory, how do we explain hypnosis and divided consciousness and social influence are the two predominant theories when we're actually talking about it.